Hi, I'm John Carroll. I'm the editor of Fierce Biotech. I'm joined by Ankit Mahadevia, the CEO at Sparrow Therapeutics. Um, I wanted to ask you a few different things about your company. It's a really interesting company that's getting involved, uh, getting started with some very new technology. Explain the technology and, and, and the kind of science behind your company and, and what you're after. No, thanks, John. The, uh, there's a, a couple of technologies that are with Sparrow. The one that we've advanced the furthest right now is our uh, MVFR program, and that's science that uh, we've collaborated on with our colleague Laurence Rahm from MGH. And, and the unique, at Harvard, right? At, at, at Harvard. And, and the unique thing about virulence inhibitors, it's different from how we traditionally think of antibiotics because uh, this is a, a medicine that doesn't actually kill the microbe. And so traditionally we think of antibiotics, I mean, the, the, the root of the term is, is to, to kill the microbe. And, and for us, the value of going after a virulence inhibitor, which has been talked about in the literature significantly about its potential but hasn't been tried, is twofold. One is that uh, you are able to have a therapeutic benefit without driving the microbes towards evolving resistance. So if a microbe's not dying, they have less selective pressure in order to create resistance genes, firstly. Secondly, as we're starting to understand more about the impact that antibiotics can have on the microbiome, the fact that you're not actually killing other microbes is an added benefit that we're only beginning to understand. Um, there's been two challenges in the industry to actually testing that hypothesis, and, and we've, we've feel that we've come through a solution to that. One is uh, finding a target that's going to be broadly applicable. And in MVFR, it's a transcription factor that controls a quarter of the genome. And that quarter of the genome is responsible for two things. One is the uh, run-up for acute infection. So a number of those genes, uh, you know, pi pseudomonas, for example, uh, in that case, uh, MVFR controls you know, nasty secretions like elastase and cyanide and pyocyanin and lots of things that make patients sick. And if you're able to limit secretion of those, you can have an impact on patients in the acute infection phase. Second part is that MVFR controls uh, the conversion of acute microbes to persistent microbes. So you think about a clinical scenario where you have a patient who took his or her antibiotics course, seems well, leaves the ICU or leaves the hospital, and then comes back sick in the next couple of days. It could be because of resistant microbes, but also it could be because of microbes that are persistent or sort of lay dormant away from the immune system. And MVFR controls that conversion. So it's sort of a, you know, a, a, like a, to sort of a, a two-part hypothesis for why this could actually make sense and why it's so unique. And so we've been able to find the right target. We found a potent set of inhibitors that we're taking forward. And, and, and secondly, we've, uh, with the, with the uh, help of John Rex and other advisors of ours on the clinical side, figured out a path to actually develop it with our colleagues at Roche. you got a great scientific advisory group. I mean, it's really remarkable, some of the individuals that are on there. Tell me a little bit about how you brought those people together, because you haven't spent a ton of money on the company, but you have got a lot of, of leaders in this field together to advise you about this. How did that happen? Who are these people, and how did that happen? Yeah, th thanks, John. Uh, let, let me comment on a few things. So, yeah, we've been fortunate not to have to have raised a lot of money. Certainly, our collaboration with Roche helps. Um, so so, you know, um, but, but with that, we've been able to uh, uh, recruit a very strong, not just a team, but a set of advisors, as you said. Uh, and, and really, it's good old-fashioned, you know, networking. And, and I think that as we started Sparrow and brought on folks like Tom Parr, like my, Mike Pucci and our team who have 50 years of antibiotics experience between them and are extremely well-networked, uh, Tom First Mike and now Tom sit on the program committee for the, for the uh, discipline's biggest scientific conference. Uh, Mike actually today uh, couldn't come to the conference because he's at the FDA speaking on how we're going to develop MVFR inhibitors. These are tremendously well-respected and networked colleagues of mine. And you know, through their relationships and the fact that they saw enough to join us, uh, has really attracted a number of really talented people. Well, let's talk about Roche for a second because sure. it's interesting. Big Pharma, of course, got out of antibiotics for in a big way. Um, the market didn't wasn't very appealing for them. Uh, they weren't making the kind of money that they needed to make in order to stay in there. It's a difficult field. Um, there are a lot of challenges towards doing this. It takes a long time to develop some of these programs, and they, they bailed out. Now Roche is one of the companies that's getting back into it. So have the economics fundamentally changed about antibiotics? 
So in our opinion, very much so, yes. And you know, we, you know, our, our, our colleagues, both at Roche, but also at, uh, at Cubist and at the Medicines Company and other groups that are, are really making a push here can comment as well. Um, you know, the distinction to make is that there will be value. And you know, we, we, we've been part of, you know, for example, the discussions uh, that led up to the PCAST recommendation. We've been part of uh, conferences. We've been part of FDA and NIH joint, joint sessions and understood and heard what the payers have to say. And so, you know, for us, the distinction to make is between sort of your uh, first line antibiotic for, you know, for example, outpatient uh, pneumonia or otitis media versus, you know, multi-drug resistant microbes that put patients in the hospital, keep them there for a long time and ultimately kill them. So for example, uh, one of the applications for MVFR and also for one of our new pipeline programs is uh, pseudomonas related ventilator associated pneumonia. Mortality rates from, for that can range from you know, 25 to 40 percent in some centers. And so if you have a diagnosis of, of VAP, you have a one in four or worse chance of dying. And for infections like that, it's our opinion, especially with diagnostics that help you subset those patients, that you will get paid for them. You know, look at the pharmacoeconomic benefit of it. Look at the pricing already for broad spectrum antibiotics that are used in the ICU, like Zyvox, like linazolid, for example. So if you have something that's even more exquisitely targeted, it's our opinion, and you know, we have to see this play out, that pricing will start to evolve the way it did for orphan diseases. You look at the GAIN Act and some of the protections that are within the GAIN Act, uh, including uh, patent exclusivity and regulatory advancement, uh, mirror what happened with orphan disease. And the unique thing with orphan oncology or orphan disease, or in our case, uh, orphan-like uh, infections, is that you can find those patients, subset them, have a medicine that's tailored to their needs, and save their lives. And that for us, that's sort of the, the three three pronged argument that we think will uh, play so well. So, what do you know whether or not you have a product? I mean, how long does it take? I mean, from where you're starting right now to, yeah. to so, the kind of data that you need. So, to, to your point, yeah, all, all drug development is hard. The, the 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 good news about any infectives is that the models actually have a lot of fidelity with what's going to happen in the patient. And so, for us, with the results we're seeing in vivo, and you know, same goes with our other pipeline programs, we actually can get a good read if you, if you understand the pharmacokinetics of your molecule and you understand where it kills microbes or disarms them and when, uh, you have a pretty good sense of what it's going to do in humans. And then the, the challenging and the unknown unknown is going to be safety. So you know, early on, we learned a lot about whether our approaches are going to hold water, and we think they do. Um, safety remains to be seen, but it's the same with any any other molecule in our business. So was there any particular point, I'm just kind of curious, because I know your group is very asset oriented, right? They're, they're not taking a lot of crazy chances or going down various blind alleys of science or anything like that. Was there any particular kind of a case that you had to make in terms of, you know, this is where I want us to invest and, and this is why I want us to invest? Was there any particular point that you made that made the difference between go and no go? So, you know, from, a, from, a, from an Atlas perspective, actually, uh, the firm has had a good track record in anti-infectives. And, you know, we were, uh, my, you know, our colleague Jean-Francois was on the board of a company called Novixel, which sold to AstraZeneca for uh, a very nice return. And so we've seen the value that advanced anti-infectives can bring. What actually stopped us from jumping in was the regulatory environment. If you talk to Ian Buchanan, who's the CEO of Novixel, he would tell us, don't invest because you know we just don't know what the regulatory path was going to look like in the you know three four years since he said that that stance has changed dramatically formally with uh, you know legislation like gain and adapt and informally in the conversations we've had with the regulators um, it's just a very different environment um, as, as my colleague Tom who's been in the business for 30 years can note it's never been as collaborative and as fluid as it used to be and it feels like a new era so for us, it's, it's, it's about MBFR, but it's also about putting together a pipeline that embraces the idea that, okay, now you can go after things that are not bactericidal, that don't kill microbes. You can go after things that are only going after certain patient subsets. And you can go after things that, you know, before would have been, you know, a couple of large phase 2B trials. And now there's a pathway where there can actually be a shorter path to going right to the patients that need it. And the subsets, actually, that's an attractive element now, right now, to the FDA, as opposed to being anything that, that, that may have posed a hurdle at another stage, is now something that they, that they really like to see when, when companies come down. Yeah, I exactly, and I think you're commenting more generally, and, and, right. and, and same, same with uh, anti-infectives, because 
it's not about getting as large a patient population as possible to get a large safety database. It's about finding that subset where this drug works, getting that on the label, and then, and then moving on from there. Well, good luck with that. And uh, <laughs> we'll be watching your progress closely as you continue down the pipeline. Thank you very much. Thanks, John. Okay.